Tonight, on. on this episode of Veterans Voices, we'll be talking with a group of veterans about pride in service. Pride in military service is something that many people may assume flows freely in the hearts of veterans. The truth is that this may not always be the case. Here on our program, we believe that talking about pride and what can sometimes stand in the way with each other and our community is an important part of healing. We are glad you're with us. If you're online, please share this broadcast with your friends, family, and other vets. We'll be right back. I'm Nathan Johnson, Marine veteran and the Contra Costa County Veteran Service Officer. The mission of Veterans Voices is to serve the community by sharing and discussing veterans topics and issues and connecting with veterans and their families to resources. We have a new teleprompter operator tonight, so bear with us. If you're watching tonight and would like to share an experience or ask a question, please call us at 925-313-1170. Our phone lines are open and we can encourage you to call in. You can also send us an email at veteransvoices at contracostatv.org or connect with us on Facebook at Veterans Voices One. We would like to acknowledge our shadow boxes and other military artifacts that our guests brought with them tonight. Nathan Johnson uh, served in the Marine Corps from 1999 to 2003. He was an intel bubba. He deployed to Pakistan and Iraq. He was discharged as a sergeant in 2003. Hoorah. Damian Bramlett served in the US Army. He was an infantryman served from 2002 to 2005 in the 3rd Infantry Division, 29th Brigade Combat Team, and Damien comes from a military family. Shauna Springer is a psychologist who has worked closely with military service members and veterans for over 10 years. Known to many veterans as Doc Springer, and to Marines as Double Doc Springer, she has been adopted into the circle of trust within the tribe of those who have served in the military. Allison Flames served in the U.S. Navy overseas in Yokosuka, Japan, on the USS Ronald Reagan CVN-76, worked as an aviation boats and wanes, mate of fuels fueled FA-18s, also worked as an aviation boats and, boats and wane mate of launch and recovery equipment, launching and recovering aircraft. Nogo Wilner Kessler served in the IDF Medical Corps from 1987 to 1989. She served in the research branch in the Mental Health Division as an academic officer and was discharged as a second lieutenant. Ryan Berg served in the Marine Corps from 2000 to 2007. He was not a POG. He deployed twice to Iraq and was discharged as a corporal. <clears throat> Stephen Burchick served as a sergeant with the 1st Infantry Division in Vietnam. This combat infantry badge is his most significant award. So tonight I'm joined by four veterans and one staunch veteran advocate who have honorably served their country and community. Damian Bramlett, Shauna Springer, Allison Flames, Noga Kessler, and Ryan Berg. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. So tonight we're gonna have a real conversation about our military service and the pride in which we may find in our service or the areas in which we may struggle with um, feeling proud of our service. So uh, we've already kind of introduced everyone's military service through shadow boxes and such, so we can kind of skip over that part. Um, we tried to balance the, the panel tonight to reflect as best we could the, the veterans community that's out there, having some have, who have served in peacetime, some who have served in wartime, some who have served overseas in different branches of service and such. So, uh, we invite our audience to participate in the conversation tonight. Um, hopefully you will feel confident and comfortable and trusting in this panel and that uh, questions that you may have about your service uh, you can address and certainly questions about our service you can address as well. So, um, you know, I'll start it off. I think I served in 1999, which was a, a time of peace. And uh, you know, one thing I've found about my military service that's somewhat difficult to understand or even um, really make any sense of is that half of it was during the time of peace. We played a lot of war games and after 9-11 ended up in places like Pakistan and places like Iraq. So things shifted pretty quickly. Um, things changed um, throughout the last half of my military service. So, and uh, you know, I remember, I remember this country was very 
patriotic at the time. Um, and I think one thing that's been challenging for me in terms of pride, pride in my service is that the country has somewhat shifted in terms of its views and opinions of the wars in Iraq and, Af and in Afghanistan. So it um, seems somewhat more politically based. And I know historically wars like Vietnam experienced much more significant um, effects from, from that. But um, yeah, I think coming back from Iraq, it was in 2003, it was pretty difficult to understand um, why when we left there was a lot of American flags waving and when I came back there were some signs being held up that we shouldn't have gone to Iraq or not. So I don't know. It, I don't know how that sits with you, Ryan. You, you're kind of shaking your head. Yeah, I, um, I was talking with a close friend recently about that, you know, about um, <laughs> whether or not you agree with the war. Some have said, you know, a large portion of society, I think, believes that in some ways the war was built on deception or lies perhaps. Now, I don't know. I mean, I have my own feelings about that, but um, I think what, what my friend brought to my own aware, to my awareness is that maybe I have been carrying some of the shame that our politicians have, you know, mm. or or should carry um, have, you know, and so um, I, I reflected on that, you know, and I thought about it, and, and I have, you know, I have because um, it's 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 pretty apparent in society about you know especially in california about the way we feel about the war it's often hard to separate the warrior from the war and so um but yeah just the fact i mean that iraq was in some ways um like why did you know why did we go to iraq i read mm -hmm. an interesting article in the new york times recently about just about that because i think it's a fair question you know i mm -hmm. think it's it's kind of open to some interpretation, and um, but yeah, I, I appreciate you sharing. About do you feel it. responsible for that answer? Do you think? I mean, for, for that question, I should say. Um, I often find that when I meet people and they find out that I served, they often ask questions like, "Well, do you think we should have gone to Iraq?" As if I'm responsible for answering that question. It's like, mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I'm glad that when I was there that we went. I saw the way people lived there, and they lived horribly, and I felt like we were able to help them. But in terms of why the country decided to go. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not really sure I'm responsible for that question mm -hmm. or an answer to that question. Right. Um, so sometimes I, I don't tell people I serve in the military any longer mm -hmm. in some situations. Obviously, in my capacity professionally as a county veteran service officer, it's important that I do so. Mm -hmm. But personally, out in public, I'll do my best to kind of withhold that information. I don't know if anyone else relates to that. Again, I, I'm not trying to compare it to the Vietnam generation in which it was very openly opposed, but today, in, in certain respect, I kind of refrain from that as best I can. I actually compare the two wars in some ways, you know, the Vietnam War and the modern era wars in terms of this dimension, that people are starting to ask the same kinds of questions. And when they have sacrificed so much and lost dear friends and they're kind of reckoning with these questions, it's, it's very challenging and adds to the complexity of the impact of, of service. But mm -hmm. you know, as we were starting the show, I felt like this urge to say, but I didn't serve. I didn't mm -hmm. serve in the military. Like there's this voice inside me saying, like, should I even be here? Right? Mm -hmm. And I'm not here as a professional to give mm -hmm. professional opinions, but just to share and be vulnerable that I think all of us have this voice at some level of like, who do you think you are? Mm -hmm. I know I certainly have it with, with veterans. Um, because I feel at home with them, do they always feel at home with me? It's sort of an open question. So I'm interested in exploring pride in service and the converse, which is maybe some shame or vulnerability around those issues. What about others of you? Well, my situation is a little bit different in that um, in Israel, everybody serves. It's compulsory service. And in Israel, it is uh, a very important part of your identity, what you do, how you do it, and uh, part of your uh, acceptance in society. And um, so it's, it's, it's quite different in that respect. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah. Well, again, I want to invite our audience. We're trying to have a real conversation tonight about a very real topic, and that's where we find pride or where we might find difficulty in having pride in our military service. So having served in the military is a very, um, is an honorable thing, and I think quite an opportunity in this country. And I want to come back, to really, if I can, Shauna, I've noticed really over the years that as I ask people if they served in the military, in instances where they didn't serve, mm -hmm. um, they kind of turn it, you know, their eyes to the side. They almost seem a little embarrassed, maybe, or maybe shameful. I don't know. It seems that maybe there's a little bit of hurt that they feel that they didn't serve in the military. Can you relate to that at all? 
Well, I think there's kind of this understanding that if you serve, that it presumes there's some level of self-sacrifice mm -hmm. in your character, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe that civilians don't have that. Mm -hmm. And in my case, working at the VA was my way of serving our country. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't go in with that mentality, I wouldn't have been able to stay for eight years to the day. Mm -hmm. But to me, that was my way to serve. Yeah. And so it's a mixed bag for me. You know, yeah. I feel very proud of the trust that I'm able to build and the people that I've walked with. But yeah. there's always that other little piece of, yeah. do I really belong in the circle? Yeah. So in a country where service is optional, and in some countries, Noga, you know, where uh, service is mandatory, mm -hmm. I mean, how does, that, how does that result in some of the feelings that you have, Allison or Damien, about your service in the military? I think going back to what uh, the two of you were saying with regards to questioning your service later on, I kind of feel that's a normal thing mm -hmm. when I first got out. Um, I didn't really think about it. I was too occupied with trying to figure out what am I doing next? Where am I, how am I gonna pay for rent and yeah. <laughs> food and right. all that stuff? Mm -hmm. And then over time it got to where like, well, you know, now I'm a bit older, I wake up with aches and pains every morning. We've got yeah. a host of other physical issues. And, and there are times that I, I question myself like, was it worth it? Was like enlisting worth it in the end and where I'm at now and then knowing kind of going down the road, like <clears throat> physical stuff, like say arthritis, like it's only gonna get worse, it's not gonna mm -hmm. get better. Mm -hmm. So part of me thinks like, well, it, you know, was it worth it, was it not? And so they're, depending on the day and how I'm feeling that morning, mm -hmm. you're gonna ask me that question, you're gonna get a different answer every time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I definitely agree with you, Damien. I feel like sometimes, you know, you could be at a supermarket or something and someone overhears a conversation about, you know, you serving in the military and they like, come up to you and they're like, oh my gosh, thank you for your service. Mm. In that moment, you feel prideful. But then they, there's other times when, you know, like you said, that you wake up some days and you're like, was it worth it? When you wake up mm. and your back is throbbing. And I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, for me, I, I feel like I am so grateful that I did serve. I mean, mm. there are times when, you know, I feel like, man, like I should have done that or mm. I should have said this or things like that. But mm. I mean, I don't think I would be where I am now if I hadn't served. Mm -hmm. And I feel so grateful for that. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you look back and, and kind of judge what you could have done better and how you could yeah. have done things better, what, what do you normally look at? Anything in particular? Specific events and how you handled them or um, specific ways that you picked a job or picking the Navy in general? or. Uh, I mean, probably uh, picking a job. Mm -hmm. um, I did pick to be an undesignate, undesignated airman, mm -hmm. um, which was um, a little hard um, when you're serving on a ship because you have to have a certain level of experience before they allow you to pick an actual job. Mm. Um, but I definitely got a lot of experience that I would never have gotten if I didn't choose to be undesignated. Mm -hmm. I would have been stuck in one exact MOS. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually really grateful for that too. Yeah, yeah, I think I can relate to that. I mean, it may sound somewhat absurd, but growing up in a small town, I didn't know the first thing about the Marine Corps. I did not know that the Marine Corps had infantrymen. You know, I didn't know the difference between an intelligence analyst or a crew chief. In fact, I signed up to be a crew chief and they said that I was colorblind and they wouldn't let me do that. So I just kind of picked, eh, you know, intelligence sounds pretty cool. <laughs> so when I got to the Marine Corps and realized that, you know, the Marine Corps is basically, uh, you know, a, an infantry force, it, it was kind of surprising to me, you know, and I think quickly learned that every role in the Marine Corps supports the infantryman. So, you know, I felt humble being in a role of support, but at the same time feel like, and you know, an infantryman is kind of the core. It's kind of the epicenter of the Marine Corps. So why not go and do, you know, do that job? Why not be a part of what the real Marine Corps really is? So I think guys struggle at times mm -hmm. with whether intelligence was, you know, a significant enough job to pick or not. Yeah. Uh, it, I feel proud. Uh, a lot of people think, you know, when I say intelligence, that I was like in some like big room with satellite feed and, you know, like assets on the ground reporting, you know, information to me. But I was in I was in an infantry battalion, and my job was to put red stickies on a map board and talk on the radio. Like it was that basic. So 
I had a top secret clearance, but really like I knew that a top secret computer had an orange sticker on it, and that's the best that I knew. So, <laughs> so it's kind of this like, it's this, it's this difficult place to be in where it's like, yeah, I'm a pogue, you know, I'm an, in, I'm an intelligence guy, but yet I'm not really an intelligence guy because I'm not doing any high speed, low drag kind of stuff, so. But, you know, I think these are the things that I look back at somewhat similar to you. <laughs> yeah, I, I relate to that, Nathan. You know, sometimes I feel ashamed of myself for being a Marine Corps reservist. Mm -hmm. You know, although I was an infantryman, mm -hmm. I was at the heart of things. Um, you know, rather than having gone active duty and be, being a Marine every day, I think, um, I, you know, maybe I hold that against myself in mm -hmm. some way. Um, and to be honest, you know, I, I've often wondered was I a real Marine, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I think some of that is part of the culture in the Marine Corps, you know? Um, as you know, um, reservists are called certain terms, are mm -hmm. named certain terms in boot camp, yep. and, uh, and even throughout, you know? You're, you're really hated by the active duty guys, um, mostly probably because you're going home when they're going off to their units right. and whatever else. So, right. so I think I've struggled with that too. Um, and I think it's only after I've, you know, only after I've talked about my experiences and recognized their value that I'm coming to terms with, yeah, of course I was a real Marine and in uh, working through it. Mm -hmm. you know, so, yeah. We have an email. Thank you. We have an email from um, an anonymous person. Uh, do any of the vets feel more guarded about their service in a school or work setting. So I'll give our panel just a second to think about that and thank our audience for that question. Hopefully we are setting a good, safe, you know, comfortable tone that we can talk about our own vulnerabilities about our military service, where we feel proud and where we may struggle to feel proud. So by us doing this tonight, we invite you, our audience, to participate by email. You can send in a message by Facebook and we'd love to have a phone call from you as well. So. Um, so I'm actually yeah. very fortunate that I, I'm able to work um, as a veterans coordinator. So actually having served in, in the medical corps, in the mental health division, um, has really been uh, an opportunity for me to share my experience. So I'm mm. very fortunate in that way. Um, yeah. Some of the areas that, that I worked in was in post-traumatic stress disorder. So for me, I'm, I feel very lucky that, that yeah. my experience I'm able to, to share it right now, 30 years later, in the work that I do. Is that one of the first things that you share, Noga, with, with your clients? Uh, not as much with my clients as with uh, other staff okay. that, that look to understand um, perhaps veterans that are, that are going through post-traumatic stress um, at end of life or whatnot, but, but even to, to share um, having served uh, in in uh, the military, in uh, the medical corps, mm -hmm. I'm able to share some of my mm -hmm. experiences mm -hmm. with um, in the healthcare profession, with with nurses, mm -hmm. social workers, other uh, colleagues that I work with. Yeah. So. Yeah, I'm kind of similar to you in that, being the county veteran service officer, I think it's an advantage to being a veteran. Absolutely. But you know, I sometimes, um, I sometimes don't really share that right away. I kind of let the veteran figure that out for mm -hmm. some reason. I'm not sure why. Maybe it, maybe if I share my military service, I feel like I am somewhat trying to one-up them. You know, oh, I served in the Marine Corps, I was in Iraq. Well, so I want them to kind of maybe learn that on their own and, and, and mm -hmm. understand that on their own and maybe help them feel more comfortable with me in my role as an advocate for them. So I think I use it somewhat strategically. I don't know why, but uh, what about in, in school and work environments? Allison, you're in school. I am in school right now. I'm currently uh, pursuing my um, associates in business. Um, so when I first went to DVC, um, I actually had no idea that there was a veteran community on campus. Mm -hmm. So when I had met someone in one of my math classes, they had actually walked me over to the building and introduced me. Um, but even at that point, I still hadn't actually told anyone about my service mm. or anything that I did while I was there. Mm -hmm. um, it actually took one very brave veteran who actually kind of pulled me out of my shell a little bit and started asking me questions while we were sitting at one of our community tables. Mm. Um, and at that point, it kind of just opened me up and I was able to tell them almost every part of my service, and they actually helped me, you know, go through benefits and 
get me started on the right track. Mm. So it was really awesome. Mm. Right. When you do share, and in this instance, you said someone kind of helped you. Mm -hmm. What are the parts that you feel that you share? Um, I share being in Japan the most. Mm. Um, it was one of my favorite deployments that I went on. Mm. Um, just the culture is beautiful there, and I wish I could go back. Mm. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about your deployment there. Was it for like six months? That in my mind is a deployment of six months, <laughs> but. Mm. Um, so while we were in Japan, um, our ship was actually stationed there, the USS Ronald Reagan. Um, so when you're stationed there, you are in port in Yokosuka for about six months under SRA, which is like ship readiness. So we're doing like repairs and everything. Um, and then for like the other half of the year, the other six months, we're out to sea going to different ports and patrolling. I'm just getting word from the, the crew that they're showing pictures as you're talking about this. So our audience oh. is getting to see a little bit of it. So, um, so, so does it feel good? I mean, I see you smiling. You say that's one of my favorite places. But it, does, it, does it feel good to share about experiences like Yokosuka, Japan? And do you feel people asking you questions like, well, did you go to Iraq? I mean, are they accepting mm -hmm. of Japan as like, that's a deployment? Uh, or, or do you feel that, or, or maybe that's not the way they're accepting. Do you feel accepting as well? Of, of Yokosuka, Japan, and that being a deployment, one that you, I mean, the smile on your face still exists. <laughs> um, or do you feel, you feel any challenge there? Um, I feel like sometimes that I'm considered that I, I wasn't deployed, I guess, in a way. Um, but then when I talk about my service to other service members, they do tell me that that is a deployment. Mm -hmm. Like, you were stationed overseas. Mm -hmm. You served overseas. That counts. Yeah. And so it does make me happy. I am smiling. Yeah. Um. I'll confess, I avoided, <laughs> I avoided Japan like the plague. Like, I didn't want to go to Japan. So, you know, so I, I, I was happy to say, no, nope, put me in Camp Pendleton, sunny California, you know, and not, not go to Okinawa, Japan, which is where Marines typically go. So. You gain so much culture for being overseas, yeah. and I wish you got to experience it. It's yeah. beautiful. Mm. Mm. Sorry I missed out. <laughs> <laughs> What about anyone else in terms of sharing your, about your military service in the work zone? Damien, you? I, I don't do it as much these days. I worked for the VA for a while. Mm. And the program that I worked on, I was always out there working with veterans as well as giving talks and all that. So I got tired of always having to kind of announce that I'm a veteran. I'm a veteran. Mm. I'm a veteran mm. of the military. And so now I don't really do that anymore. Mm. It, family know, friends know. Mm -hmm. If I meet people for the first time, I usually don't <clears throat> bring it up unless it's necessary. Hmm. Say if I meet somebody and it turns out, oh, hey, they're in the service as well, then I might bring it up. And even then, it's just kind of very, yeah, I was in the Army, and then I just leave it at that. And it's talk, yeah. it's not anything to do with, like, I'm not proud of my service. It's just mm -hmm. more of, like, I usually don't want to get into the conversation of, oh, okay. of military service or some people want to drag out all sorts of information from you and it yeah and it also depends on the the setting that it's in and kind of where yeah. where I'm at like uh, mentally and emotionally you know yeah I'm kind of excited to talk about that because I think I think that's a very real thing right there's a hesitancy to kind of maybe open up that door to where the conversation might go um, people ask what, what kind of questions you think when they find out that you're Veteran. The, the number one is, yeah. have you killed anybody? Yeah. Yeah. Followed by, have you seen anybody die? Oh, wow. Um, and, then, and then usually somewhere in there, it's thank you for your service, which for me is one of the most awkward phrases that somebody can hit me with. Because okay. I never know how to respond. Like, yeah, you're welcome. Or, mm -hmm. yeah. uh-huh, sure. It's usually what I do, a head nod and yeah. sure thing. Yeah. And just kind of leave it at that. But it's, it's a very awkward thing mm -hmm. for me to even hear today. And I've been out mm -hmm. since 2005. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I can relate to that. Yeah. I feel like I'm kind of dominating the conversation. What here. Do you I'm guys... not supposed to be the host, but <laughs> yeah. you know, what it's you just guys... kind of naturally what I do. I think so. Want right, instead Shana. of you know, thank you for your service. Like, what is it you would hope that people in our society would say or would do huh. as a way of bringing you home? I could say something like <laughs> welcome home. I mean, if you think of all the Vietnam vets that didn't get welcomed home, essentially. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and to a certain extent, I mean, even current generation of veterans probably don't really necessarily hear that particular phrase. You usually hear, thanks for your service, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. But I think that's probably a, a basic phrase. But I also don't 
want people to think they have to thank veterans for their service. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like I volunteered for it. Nobody forced me into it. Um, I was the one who made the stupid mistake to sign the paperwork and ship off a boot camp and all that other stuff. So for me, it's like I don't. It would be if I thanked you for your job, and if you heard that every day, I hear that time after time. It's awkward. Yeah, it would be after yeah. a while. It's just like okay, that's great, but yeah. not that it's lost meaning to me. It's like I just don't. I don't want people to feel forced that they have to say yeah. something to a veteran. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's a calling. It's not a job. So when people say, thank you for the work you do, or that must be so hard, I think, you just don't understand. And I'm not going to be able to make you understand quickly unless you know who I am and why I do this, mm -hmm. that it's a calling for me. But, but on the other hand, let me kind of look at it in a little bit different way. Um, in less than 1% serve and serve and sacrifice and in a place where a very small percentage does, mm -hmm. that service and that sacrifice is, is heavy on the shoulders. And so coming from a place where uh, everybody serves to, to another place, I, I so appreciate and I so value and honor that service and that sacrifice of such a small percentage mm -hmm. of this country. So mm -hmm. I, I would like to say something mm -hmm. um, meaningful. Yeah. My thing has been that people often, I don't think, know what they're thanking us for. Mm -hmm. And so I know it can be triggering for some, myself included, but I would rather have somebody, if they really felt gratitude or wanted to thank me, ask me what it was like, mm -hmm. you know? And I, again, I know that can be a question some may not want mm -hmm. to hear or, you know, get into, but I, I'd like to share about what it was like with someone, you know, and say, man, it, it was a scary place, you know, let me tell you. And, and this is kind of what it was like, you know, because I think that society needs to help us absorb what we went through. You know, it's, it really is too much to carry. You know, I relate to your, um, you know, when you said you wake up and your back is throbbing, you know, it, it really is too much to carry. And I think, that, emotionally speaking, and I think that the more we can share about what it was like, you know, and, and that's a broad question, you know, um, and I, I think that, yeah, because I think that society really, society should be there to help help us absorb what we want. I mean, in a way, they sent us there, mm -hmm. um, you know. Mm -hmm. So, so if if you're out there and you're listening, maybe maybe just try it. You know, hey hey, what was it like uh, mm -hmm. to be deployed or to be in the Navy or the Army and, and what you did? You know, because it, it can be a way for empathy to be you know to be there. You know. Yeah. Yeah, I feel um, we have just about a minute here, and I really like the, con the conversation for the way it is, but I, I, I relate to that in that, you know, I, I feel that as a nation, we should honor the service of our veterans. Don't get me wrong. It's, there certainly should be a thank you in some form, right? But there should be, I think, an awareness of what they're thanking us for. And, mm -hmm. and in other ways, they could be asking, well, why did you join? You know, and I was thinking about that even before you said that, Ryan. It's mm -hmm. like, well, if you really found out why I joined, it's because I joined because I thought I was going to get the GI Bill, you know, and I was going to go to college. So <laughs> you really shouldn't thank me for going to war in Iraq because I didn't choose to go. You know, it kind of happened mm -hmm. halfway through my military service. So I often think the people who joined the military after 9-11, those are the people that you should be thanking because, like, they knew you know, they knew there was a war going on. You know, 9-11 had already happened, and they made the choice, like, I, I know I could end up in places like Iraq or Afghanistan, and so mm -hmm. I'm going to sign up anyways, you know? And so mm -hmm. asking me questions about, well, why did you join, I think would be, I think it would be very opening and very honoring. I'd feel honored because I think they would show an interest in me mm -hmm. um, by, by doing so. So mm -hmm. I really like the conversation. We've got another segment to talk about this. We've got lots more to talk about, and I really appreciate that our audience has asked some questions um, by email, Facebook, call in, plenty of ways to dive into tonight's conversation about value and service. Thank you for staying with us. Are you out there with your own experiences to share or a question for one of our guests? Again, I encourage you to call in, be a part of this conversation. We'd love to hear from you. You can call in right now at 925-313-1170. We are also broadcasting on Facebook Live where you can send us a message and next up, let's all take a moment to watch this touching clip of several veterans telling us how they're really feeling. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. But I have a story and I don't know where to start. I'm good. But I feel alone in a crowd. I'm good, but nobody understands. 
I'm good, but the past keeps coming back. But I can't get out of bed. And I can't sleep. I'm good, but I feel overwhelmed. I'm good, but I don't feel safe. But I don't even know who I am anymore. But I still have nightmares, but I don't need any help. I'm good, but I don't feel anything anymore. I'm good, but I can't live like this anymore. I'm really not so good. But are you ready to listen? Welcome back to Veterans Voices. Thank you for staying with us. So we're going to continue this conversation. We've got another segment here in which we're talking about pride in military service. So again, join us with any comments or questions you might have. So I'm um, very satisfied with what we've talked about so far, but we um, got lots more to talk about. Shawnee, you said you wanted to share a story. Yeah, I wanted to share a story about how I met Damien, which was on a Team Rubicon deployment. And, um, you know, I showed up there and really felt like I was the odd person out. And it was that first day, and this, you've said it wasn't a big deal to you, but it was a big deal to me. Mm -hmm. You said, you, you, and you, come with me, we're gonna go get these F-350 trucks and caravan back from the airport. And I was a woman and a civilian, and you just grabbed me and brought me into the tribe, mm -hmm. and it mattered to me. So like coming on this show, I had a lot of mixed feelings, like should I show up, should I come? Do I even have a place here? Mm -hmm. And I came on because I feel that part of what veterans need to do is get outside of the tribe and extend their trust to people outside the tribe mm. that are worthy of the trust. So that's why I came on. Mm. And that was what launched our friendship when you were my team Rubicon ops leader. And it really made me feel like part of the tribe, even though I was having those questions. <laughs> so just wanted to share that story. It was really a cool memory. I really appreciate hearing that, actually, because it's, it's not too often that you hear how you impact other people's lives. Yeah, for so. sure. Mm. Yeah, I'm just wondering, like, in what ways does being proud of your service or having pride in your service, do you think, carry into the, um, the ways you interact with people today? Um, I feel like, I feel like the way that I, I mean, literally, the way I walked as a Marine is something that I still feel like I walk today. Like, I, I, at times I kind of find myself kind of leaning forward and wondering, like, what am I doing, you know? I'm supposed to lean back, right? Lean back, strut. So, I mean, um, I don't know, I still, I, I still identify, I think, in certain ways as a Marine, and even some of the very small things, like the way that I walk. So mm -hmm. it, it, do you guys find, and, and maybe there's ways that you're not proud of mm -hmm. the way that you conduct yourself. I think sometimes I'm somewhat quick to kind of snap at people, you know, snap my fingers and expect mm -hmm. things of people, which mm -hmm. um, I don't feel so good, at, you know, mm -hmm. about as times. So. I'm very prideful in my mannerisms now yeah. that I picked up. Um, folding clothes, and um, I still cut corners. <laughs> oh, yeah? Yeah. Like literally, like walk across the, cat, the grass, kind of cut corners? Yes. <laughs> yes, I still do it. Uh, my mom makes fun of me. Um, but yeah, and the way that I talk to people, sir, ma'am, mm -hmm. I still talk that way. Mm -hmm. I heard you in the hallway earlier addressing people as that. I don't think that's very rare to hear that. It's very, yeah. just being very respectful still. Right, right. I tend to be more direct when talking with people, especially in a meeting. And sometimes that goes well, and other times people take it as uh, they're offended because they think I'm angry or mad. And it's like, nope, I just have a very clear and forward communication style that the Army kind of beat into my head <laughs> over several years. So mm -hmm. nothing personal. I just want to get stuff done and, and get going. So I think a lot of businesses value some of the characteristics that knowing that we served in the military, you know, certain things like showing up on time and working hard and being a part of a team and such. So I think I feel proud of the ways that people identify the military or veterans as such. I think at times I don't feel so proud of the way the military is identified in terms of things like post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I struggle to say, you know, there's things that I'm dealing with in this realm um, mm -hmm. because I don't want to be labeled um, as a veteran with PTSD, it, takes, it makes me feel as proud for mm. some reason of having served because I know that the experiences that I went through were difficult, but I like to think of myself as strong. Mm -hmm. you know, I like to mm -hmm. think of myself as someone who is able to be um, able to overcome, I think, in a way. So, mm -hmm. but, 
I, I know that we have a question from Zachariah as well. It, it kind of went off the, the screen there. We'll get it back on. Um, yeah, I'm applying for jobs right now, and one of the questions is, um, you know, are you a veteran? Are you a protected veteran? And it's like, are you disabled? And I'm like, mm. well, to check or not to check, mm. you know? I mean, are, are mm. you going to use this against me, you know? And so it's just, yeah, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Like, I got, you know, mm. 0% rating for a broken toe in boot camp, but I don't think that makes me a disabled veteran. And sometimes I struggle with that, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know. Um, we have a question here. We got to back up. Zachariah from Facebook. What do you do with the pride shame and the correlation between its inherent dichotomy? Uh, tough question. <laughs> Ryan, you brought up the issue of shame. <laughs> Don't look at me, man. <laughs> Can you dumb it down? I eat what do you, browns. What do you well. do with pride? So, okay. <laughs> Let's just talk about what we do with the pride mm. and with the shame. What do we do with it? How, how do we Well, shame, how typically I stuff down, stuff it way down, and, and never really want to look at it again or feel it. Um, mm. But now I'm learning that, look, in order to feel pride, I have to feel the shame, let it process, come to terms with the fact that I was a real Marine, that I, you know, that I, that I served honorably, and mm -hmm. that I should be proud of what we did over there. You know, no matter the political choices that were made or the political reasons, no matter any of that, there's still, you know, this, there's still great reason to be really proud, you know? So um, I appreciate that question, you know, because, uh, one of the things I was thinking about in planning the show was that, you know, we, uh, pride can't flow if shame doesn't go, you mm -hmm. know? So I've been on this sort of, you know, mission to, you know, what, what would happen if I felt the shame? What would happen? Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I think I've often felt threatened by it. You know, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Perhaps if you, when we identify it, we really look at it and we see what perhaps we're shamed of, of mm. then we can move beyond it. But mm. we have to really identify what is it that we feel that we didn't do that we could have done or maybe we could have done differently mm. and then look at the situation and kind of work through it, as you said. Yeah. Work through it to get to the part where we feel proud. Mm -hmm. So not to be afraid of it, mm -hmm. really look at it. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can revisit the past in a way and understand that there are things that, you know, you wish you could have done. I mean, I wish I could have done a lot of things, yeah. but there's always I wish, I wish, or mm. what if. Mm -hmm. It's, that's in the past. You leave mm. it there. You keep moving forward and mm. you focus on what you can do now mm -hmm. to better your life now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that, uh, yeah. pos kind of positive. You know, one, one thing that I think has kind of been difficult for me over the years, and I'll kind of address it with my shadow box there, is, is a particular medal uh, that I was put in for, which I feel proud about, but then I feel ashamed because or shame, I should say, at times, because that medal, I don't believe, was ever actually awarded to me. Mm. Um, and so I know that medals sometimes can be a source of pride and a source of shame. Mm. Um, you know, I think for some people, they feel like they're awarded a medal, that they're just kind of handed out. And I joked around with the group that, you know, a, um, a, uh, a national defense medal, we refer to it as a ketchup and mustard stain. You know, it's not really a medal I feel a lot of pride in. Mm. Um, but a Navy Accommodation Medal, uh, a medal that I was put in for, was actually downgraded to a, a Navy Achievement Medal. And, and the man who made my shadow box, a World War II veteran, actually ended up putting it in there. And I don't know why he did it specifically. He's no longer alive even, so I can't even ask him about it. But, um, but medals, I think, are something that are intended to, to instill pride, something that are, we're intended to wear. And, and I think at times we kind of joke around about chesty polar in the Marine Corps. You know, you get a, a stack of medals. But... Um, I think for me, it's also, also, sometimes I just don't want to really share that. I don't really want, I don't know if I'll ever really wear those medals. Mm -hmm. you know, I never right. wore them in the Marine Corps. Yeah, and why is that, I wonder? Like, it feels like a cultural thing, right? Like, if you mm -hmm. showed up to a dinner party or some kind of celebration with your medals on, you would, especially if members of the military were there, you, it would be kind of like, what, what the heck are you doing? Who do you think you are? You know, so at what point, I question, I wonder, like, when do we get to display our medals? When do we get to be proud? of what we did, you know, mm -hmm. thinking about that. Yeah, yeah. I'm only uh, looking away because we have a question here that just popped up. Marabella from Facebook asked uh, or, or commented, I do not take offense when people thank me for service. It is meant as a gracious way to show appreciation. Yes, it may be a calling. Yes, it is your job. Take the compliment and respond with thanks for your appreciation. Thanks for the appreciation. Very good. Well, I, that's, I think that's... Um, 
a, a great way to respond and a great way to look at someone thanking them for their service. So I appreciate that comment. Mm. And I would wonder how Marabella may f feel about this comment and, uh, or this discussion about medals and such. So, um, yeah, I, Damien, you ever, do you ever get a chance to wear your medals or, f or feel like you can display them in a shadow box? And how to I've never gotten around to, I, I, well, let me backtrack a little. I think because of all the training I went through in the Army, especially as a grunt, was you be humble about what you do. Mm -hmm. You're a silent professional. Yep. You don't brag about what you've done, where you've been, all that kind of stuff. So even today, it kind of carries over. Like none of my <clears throat> none of my college diplomas are sitting on a wall. They're all in a file cabinet. Mm. All my medals and awards, like what I pulled out tonight, those were in a box under my bed with like mm. what's left of my military, you know, awards and ribbons. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's. Um, I am a veteran, but I'm not the army. Like, I don't need to wear it with me or carry it around at all times. Mm -hmm. And over the years, I've thought about uh, medals, whatever. They're, they're important in the military, but once you're done, they kind of lose that importance to a certain ex uh, extent. Right. I mean, there's a few, like, say, a Medal of Honor that stays with you the rest of your life, and mm -hmm. you're expected to wear it at all times. But um, for someone like me, it's like, it's not that I don't have any pride in what service awards and all that that I've received. It's just, well, what do you do with them once you're out? Mm -hmm. I don't dress up in uniform anymore. Um, even if I wanted to, I can't fit my old dress uniform anymore. Right. But it, it's just kind of like you said, if I showed up to some event wearing, you know, my uh, fruit salad on my chest, I'd probably get laughed at or, you know, some guys would make some comments like, you know, what the heck are you doing? Mm -hmm. Well, when I think about it, I think of your, uh, you come from uh, a military family. So to pass it on to your children and your grandchildren. Um, when I go to a home and I see three or four generations that served in the Marine Corps, it, it's something truly special to pass on. So mm. maybe that's something that it's a treasure for your children and your grandchildren, that's for sure. In your family. I know that some, and I don't mean to talk about other people who aren't here, but I know that some military veterans don't get a medal that they necessarily feel that they earned, um, which can be very difficult. You know, to, um, mm -hmm. I know a Vietnam veteran right now that I'm helping to try to get her a silver star that an officer that he served side by side with received, and he didn't receive anything. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for, for the medals that we did receive, is there any particular medal? Uh, I guess Noga and Allison, I'm kind of looking at you. Is there any particular medal or maybe combination that you received that you feel most proud about? Uh, I received, a, it wasn't a medal, but it, it was um, a certificate and, and it was, I was nominated my, by my commander mm. for my, for distinction in my, in my work. So mm. that, that was, that was a, a pretty big deal for me. I really respected my commander a lot. She, she had done a lot of work um, in, in the area of combat stress reaction and I was honored to be uh, working with her in a research branch. So when she mm. nominated me, it was, mm. It was a big honor. For How me. did you receive that? Was there some type of like formation, and they they, it they to you, all uh, gathered us together, and uh, the brigadier general uh, gave us the the certificate and sh shook our mm -hmm. hands. So it's mm -hmm. one of the photos up there. But, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about you, Allison? Uh, for me, it wasn't necessarily a medal, but um, my ribbon rack. Um, it had my marksman ribbon on it, and. I'm prideful in that because throughout my entire life, I've never really been around guns. Mm. And so it took me a long time to be okay with handling one and putting forth that work and actually being able to use one and getting a ribbon for it was actually really special to me. Mm -hmm. um, can you give our audience maybe a better understanding of what it takes to earn that? I mean, you don't just pick up the gun and, <laughs> I mean, you have to do something very specific, right? So for boot camp, we actually um, had to go through a series of a variation of laser tag. So we had these um, fake guns that had cords on them and they had uh, lasers pointing out and we had to shoot at targets. Mm -hmm. um, and then after you got good at that, then they actually allowed you to pick up a real weapon and they taught you how to um, open each chamber and make sure all the clip was all put together correctly and whatnot. Um, and then uh, we were actually able to shoot the real gun. So we actually shot a nine millimeter Beretta hmm. um, and then the 500 uh, shotgun. Hmm. So we actually had to learn different stances of how to use them, um, 
again, how to reload them and how to discharge them and everything like that and mm -hmm. how to hand them over to the next person if they were on watch. Yeah, mm -hmm. and based on how well you did, you earned a different level of um, yeah, so there's, yeah. there's different kinds. There's marksmen, yeah. and then uh, it goes up from there. Yeah, yeah. What about you, Damien? Probably, as an infantryman, the one was my uh, rifle qualification badge because we were always expected to qualify expert. Mm -hmm. And if you qualified anything less than that, then mm -hmm. you need to hit the range a little more often. So yeah. I, I was always able to qualify expert, which I'm proud of that. That's yeah. probably like the one qualification badge that I've... Yeah, one of a couple that I'm really proud of, but yeah, that was the, the Marine Corps. The marksman is like it's literally a, a square, and it has circles inside of it, and we call it a pizza box. That's so. the one you had, right? <laughs> yeah, right, right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean, it, no one wanted to be a marksman. Everyone wanted to be an expert in the Marine Corps because the marksman was just such an ugly, <laughs> <laughs> ugly badge to wear around. Mm -hmm. So, like a scarlet letter. Oh, wow, you, Ryan. Um, the one that means the most is the Iraq Campaign Medal um, because it reminds, well, it's the colors of the flag, the Iraqi flag. Yeah. And it, it just reminds me of having served the people of Iraq, kind of like what you said, Damien. Um, I think those are my fondest memories, um, interacting with the children, um, the, you know, the, the, all the families we saw in the villages. and. Um, there is a hospitality in, in Iraq that I've never seen or anywhere, you know, in my experience. And so, you know, today I have the Iraqi flag, and, you know, sort of hanging in my room. And it just, it means, you know, having served that country is what brings me pride. You know, this one, but also having done something in Iraq that was beneficial, you know, hopefully brings me yeah. pride. And you also, as we've built up to this show, have kind of been getting in touch with other family members that have served as well as part of the process of, yeah. like, that's been a really yeah. cool thing to see. Yeah, yeah, my, uh, my great, great uncle, um, Bert Emberg, was uh, killed on the, in the Battle of Tarawa when he was 19, PFC mm. Berg, and he was buried in Japan on the island. Uh, I think he, we've honored him on this show before, haven't we? No, but I think, oh. I hope we can in a few Oh, yeah, I hope we can, yeah. absolutely. He was buried there and then, uh, and then moved back, you know, um, later on, but yeah, um, yeah, it's been a, a source of pride too, that familial, mm -hmm. generational yeah. pride. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Didn't you find out recently that you, is My that, grandma yeah. is a Marine too, and that was mind blowing, you mm -hmm. know. That you was, just learned that? Yeah, I just yeah. learned. So you served in the Marine Corps. Yeah. Where you've been a Marine Corps veteran for several years mm -hmm. and just learned at your grandma. Mm -hmm. How did you learn? Like, awesome. What's the story? My uncle posted a picture, you know, of his mom on Mother's Day in her Marine, wow. you know, picture, wow. and uh, I was I was stunned, you know, to learn to learn to learn that, especially because Hello. she was a woman, and at that time it was probably not so common, and so it's it's really inspiring to know that I that I came from. Yeah, yeah. That. I think that's Absolutely. awesome. Mm -hmm. Cool. Mm. So we have a question from Vincent. Uh, who is in San Ramon, and Vincent mentioned, someone mentioned Pogue in a negative sense. What is a Pogue? <laughs> I don't remember who mentioned that, but you know, I feel like Damien or, or Ryan should probably clarify mm. what a Pogue is. Well, I think you should since, no, okay. Um, <laughs> a Pogue. He didn't is, ask what it feels like to be a Pogue. Uh, yeah, he said, what is a Pogue? Well, a Pogue is, stan is an acronym for person other than grunt. And maybe you can elaborate on. <laughs> so yeah, anyone in the in the uh, is it true in the army as well? Army as well. There's infantry okay. and then there's everybody else. Mm -hmm. There's infantry and then there's everyone else. So it's this um, somewhat narcissistic viewpoint that you know that you're only the you're the only important role in the Marine Corps and the army, and that everyone else is a support role. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's a way that we um, you know through humor yeah. try to. Um, kind of challenge each other in terms mm -hmm. of their military service. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like anyone's ever called me a pogue in a way that was truly hurtful. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't feel like anyone really wanted to devalue my military service by calling me a pogue. Mm -hmm. But um, I think it's hard to maybe take pride in being a pogue. You mm -hmm. know, it's, it is, I don't even know, you know, what a pogue, I, 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 so then it kind of, it kind of then, you know, goes downhill, what, what, what I'm struggling to, I would call someone a winger and almost refer to them the same way as someone would call me a pogue. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's different ways that I think we try to um, try to tease each other, not in a way that we're really trying to devalue each other's service. But uh, does the Navy have something like that, that? That's like, if you're not a bosun mate, you're a, 
Um, so if you are not any kind of surface rate, if mm. you're an air rate, um, they usually call you Airedales or Topsiders okay. or mm. stuff Got like it. that. Um, if you are some kind of nuke engineer, then you'd be below decks, like all the way down at the bottom, mm -hmm. um, and you'd be like, oh, they glow in the dark because they're nukes, or don't nuke it. Mm -hmm. like, Got it. <laughs> stuff Got like it. that. So it's, it's kind of in good humor, but someone could probably t maybe take offense to it? Like, Some people could take yeah. it the wrong way um, if they're not used to being joked with like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I feel like it's maybe a way for us military personnel to kind of cope with being uncomfortable. We learn mm -hmm. to make jokes and mm -hmm. make fun of other people and get out of that uncomfortable stage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I want to thank, um, we have one last question here. Donna from Facebook, I think that the only meaning a metal has is the meaning you attach to it. Interesting. Mm -hmm. well, um, that's a good, good, you know, good point. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the, the Navy Combination <laughs> Medal that, that I mentioned, you know, I, I, I think that in my mind, I can relate specifically to things in Iraq that I'm most proud about. So when I think about that medal, I do, I think about those particular events that I feel like I, I gave more than maybe what was expected of me. Do you, can you guys relate to that? You mentioned like the rifle qual. You know, anyone who doesn't really know what that means, does it, it seems like it has specific meaning to you in terms of like, I've never handled a weapon before, so. Because um, I worked really hard for it, mm -hmm. and yeah. now I know what it means to me, right. and ne not necessarily someone else would know what it means, Yeah. yeah. like uh, Donna had said. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, on the street, these medals probably have no value. If you were to <laughs> steal my shadow box and take it to a flea market, probably you'd get maybe a buck for it or something for firewood, so. <laughs> well, we're out of time. I really like this conversation, and I appreciate everyone being open and honest, and I really appreciate our audience participating. I think that maybe what we've done is just at least set some, some, some groundwork here, you know, set a base in terms of how we can discuss how we're proud and maybe at times not proud of our military service. So thank you, everyone, for, for being on the panel tonight. And thank yeah. you for tuning in to Veterans Voices tonight. And I want to sincerely, again, thank each member of our panel for showing up and speaking authentically on behalf of their experiences and feelings related to their service. Being vulnerable and sharing like this is often difficult to do with a trusted friend. And so doing it on live television with the public can require even more courage. So thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. We wanted to leave you with a few events and resources. As a reminder, all of these can be found on our Veterans Voices website. Vets for Warriors is a national 24-7 peer support network for veteran and military communities, 100% staffed by trained veterans and members of the military community, their families and caregivers. Learn more at www.vetsforwarriors.com. Veterans Path enables returning veterans to rediscover meaning and purpose and joy in their lives through mindfulness, meditation, and a safe community. Visit www.veteranspath.org to learn more. Headstrong is a cost-free, bureaucracy-free, and stigma-free treatment alternative for the hidden wounds of war. Visit them at getheadstrong.org. The Contra Costa County Veterans Service Office provides assistance to veterans, their dependents, survivors, and the general public in obtaining benefits for the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs, Department of Defense, California Department of Veteran Affairs, and other programs for veterans and their families. Please call us at 925-313-313. 1481 to make an appointment and see what we, you may be eligible for. To rewatch tonight's episode, check back on our homepage later this week or check your cable provider's schedule for rebroadcast times. You can also rewatch this episode and many others on our YouTube channel, Veterans Voices of Contra Costa. So be sure to subscribe. Our next live broadcast will be Monday, June 17th at 7 p.m. We'll be live at the Concord Hilton, so tune in. This is Veterans Voices of Contra Costa County signing out and wishing you all a relaxing evening. And for all the veterans out there, a ro oh. Hoo -ya. And we will finish with a poem by Marion Wilson, excuse me, Marion Williamson, called Our Deepest Fear, delivered by Ryan Berg. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous, proud? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God, 
Your playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We're all meant to shine, as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It is not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we're liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. We leave you with this heartfelt video that tells the story of a group of veterans who have found pride and purpose in their service and transition by forming a band and creating music, music together. Check it out. We end tonight with a band of warriors who've become a real band. Here's David Martin. In a house in the woods in the middle of Pennsylvania, this place some of the most important music in America is being played by a band called The Resilient. We'll struggle on. You don't need to be a music critic to say that. All you have to do is look. That I am myself. Nate Kalwicki on guitar lost his right leg in Afghanistan. Marcus Dandry on bass lost both legs. So did lead vocalist Tim Donnelly. Can't stand on my own. Juan Dominguez lost both legs and an arm, but somehow plays the drums. With a special pedal and drumstick, he's not some novelty act. I am a drummer. I'm the drummer for The Resilient, and we're going to do big things. The only member of The Resilient with all his body parts is Greg Lohman, a professional musician who met the others in their darkest hour, searching for a purpose in life while recovering from their wounds. Through the recovery, we all discovered this really intense passion for honest musicianship, and um, they've all gotten so good. <laughs> the house belongs to Tim Donnelly, handicap accessible, with doorways wide enough for wheelchairs. It gets a little ridiculous, it's like bumper cars. This is one of your songs. He writes the songs as well as sings them. I want you like I've never wanted anything but true. That says it all about falling in love with his wife Kelly and coming to grips with his wounds. We just wear our scars on the outside, whereas most people have, you know, they've got all their own messed up stuff going on inside. Some of his lyrics tell you of the dark places they've been. And it's my own fault that I've got no one else. But listen to what Nate Kalwicki says about his life now. I want to go back and change things, you know. Yeah. It just shifted the, the course in my life. You wouldn't go back and change things. Does everybody here think that? Definitely. I wouldn't change it. There's a contentment and kind of like an excitement to knowing that like I'm where I'm supposed to be. Where the resilient are right now is working on their first album. What do you have to do next to make it? Keep getting better, keep getting stronger, keep playing. It doesn't feel like it can go anywhere but up. Can music heal? One, two, three, four. You be the judge. David Martin, CBS News, Bethel, Pennsylvania. Good night, everybody.